Hey guys, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story. If you are new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you can get alerted when I post new videos. And now on to today's topic. Today's topic, we are going to talk about one of the worst outlaws in New Mexico history. His name was Pedro Navarez, and his history is actually well before the state of New Mexico existed, before Mexico technically existed, when it was all Spanish territory, and uh, and the Spanish were in the area colonizing and uh, setting up missions and everything. So Pedro Navarro is believed to be an Apache outlaw, but some say maybe he had some Mexican blood, uh, may have been of Mexican descent. But his his nickname was Chato, um, which I believe is a Spanish word, um, has something to do with a misshapen nose, and that was because they said that he was missing part of his nose from a knife fight. So he operated out of the Rio Grande Valley, um, up into what is New Mexico now, close to the Las Cruces area was where his hideout was. And he operated between the years of 1639 and 1649. This is when he was, um, he had his gang and he was attacking a lot of the uh, pack trains that came through to supply the Spanish missions and, and uh, you know, the little Spanish towns and stuff like that in New Mexico uh, of the time. So if you know, New Mexico really technically started in the, you know, 1500s, early 1600s, some of the earliest Spanish missions built around the Santa Fe area were built around 1610. So this is well before the pilgrims even even came over so um anyhow so we're what we're looking at now is is he's operating out of this area that that is now las cruces new mexico and his his gang would rob these wagon trains and travelers that were heading up north along the rio grande river there was a well-worn road or path that uh you could follow all the way up to you know albuquerque and and uh, Santa Fe, the missions and towns along the way, along the river. And a lot of these these uh, caravans and mule trains had a lot of riches and, and goods and supplies and stuff that they were taking up to these locations. So... Uh, Pedro Navarez and his man, they would they would attack these these uh, mule trains. They would take food, guns, ammunition, silver, gold, mining equipment, any anything that they could. They would take from these vulnerable pack trains, and uh, a lot of these pack trains they had all kinds of supplies, but they really didn't have any military protection. And sometimes they were operated by monks and priests and and uh and so they offered little resistance so after these robberies they would disappear to a hideout in it was said to be in soledad canyon and this was somewhere east of present day las cruces so the biggest score that they had was said to be in April of 1649. They robbed a pack train of monks that were heading north on the Rio Grande River Road. And they had left a monastery north of Mexico City at um, Alcaman. And so they had left, and we're talking hundreds of miles. So they, they were loaded down with all kinds of gold artifacts like candle holders, crucifixes, statuaries, chalices, all kinds of gold artifacts meant for all these different Spanish missions they had established up and down the Rio Grande River. And they were they were um, the nonviolent Augustinian monks and they when they got around the Las Cruces area, they had unpacked their mules, they were letting their mules graze, and they were gathering some firewood, and that's when uh, Pedro Navarra's bandits, um, they came up and, and basically were able to attack them. I guess the, the monks didn't put up much resistance, so the bandits loaded the mules back up with all of the, with all of the gold and basically took off with them. 
So, so they had this um, this cache of all kinds of uh, you know all kinds of gold artifacts. And a couple miles away, they stopped the pack train. They looked over everything, and they were surprised that they had a huge cache of silver coins. Also, so they were extremely ecstatic that that this was a bigger score than than they had had even realized. Lots of gold, lots of silver, and. They divided some of the silver coinage up amongst, you know, all the bandits. And then they took the rest to their cave hideout in Soledad Canyon. So the monks end up walking back to the town of El Paso del Norte, which I believe is El Paso, Texas today. They sent news back to the, the Alcaman mission. And weeks later... Apparently this had happened probably a few times. So weeks later, what happened is they decided that uh, they were going to stop these bandits. And there was um, armed soldiers that arrived in El Paso del Norte. And they were dressed as monks. And they were going to take this pack train up the valley. And there was little of value on this this pack train. But I believe it was made to look like it was going to be a valuable score. They wanted to entice the bandits to attack them. And so, so they, they set out from El Paso del Norte, not, not too far from, you know, this area of, you know, current day Las Cruces where, where these uh, bandits would typically attack people. So these Spanish soldiers, you know, their, their whole idea was if they got attacked, they were going to try to kill or capture as many of the, of the bandit, you know, Navarrez's men a, as they could. So Navarrez's men, they spotted this approaching pack train and then they moved in for the attack. And then they were surprised when all of these apparent monks threw back their cloaks and they were fully armed. And some of both sides died, but the outlaws were pretty badly defeated. They just were totally caught off guard. And those that were not killed were taken prisoner and roped together and marched back to Alcaman. So you're talking hundreds of miles south to, uh, you know, I think it was about 40 miles north of Mexico City. So Navarrez was one of the prisoners. He wasn't killed in the battle, and uh, a few of his other guys managed to not get killed, but they ended up down in Mexico. They were tried and found guilty and sentenced to hang. So they awaited their fate in the prison cells that they were in, and Navarrez tried to be befriend a guard that brought him food and tried to buy his way out of prison, you know, before he could be hung. So he told the guard about the treasure in Soledad Canyon, you know, far north of there, and Navarrez didn't know it, but this guard was, was also a monk and wrote down all of the details of the treasure location. So Navarrez and his companions were actually hung the next week. So the story would have ended here if it wasn't for the fact that uh, of an event that occurred in July of 1930. We'd probably never know about this otherwise. So there was a man in El Paso that had a very old safe. And he said it was from a monastery in Alcaman in Mexico. And it had been handed down in his family for generations and generations. And he wanted to restore this safe. And he brought it to a gentleman that that was known to restore safes and trunks and lock boxes and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So once this gentleman got the safe open, there was a document that was hidden between the outer wall and the inner lining of the safe. So this gentleman finds this document, but it's written in Castilian Spanish. And he was not able to read it. None of them were able to read it or translate it or anything like that. So once this safe is restored, it's this document is also given to the owner as he picks up the safe. And, and he ends up taking it to a Spanish linguist at the University of Texas and had it translated. And it, it turned out to be... One of that that monk's transcription of the treasure location, and it, so these were the words that were transcribed down from 
the account of Pedro Navarez before he was led to the gallows, like the, the week prior. And the translation reads as follows. Go to El Paso de Norte and inquire where the Oregon Mountains are. The mountains are located up the river, two days travel from El Paso de Norte by back, or by horseback. It is a large mountain range with some peaks on it. You will find these mountain in these mountains two gaps. One is called Tortuga and the other is called Soledad. Before entering the first gap, turn to your right and go about in the middle of the slope of the mountain where you will find a very thick juniper tree. From this, uh, from this tree, proceed downhill 100 paces to a spot covered with small stones. Look for a blue stone a, a great deal larger than the others. A cross was made on this stone by a chisel. Remove this slab and dig about a man's height and you will find a hole full of silver taken from the packs of six mules. You will find at the bottom of this hole some boards. Remove the boards and you will find coins from three mule trains we captured and buried there. Follow this, go to Soledad Canyon and follow up the pass until you reach a very large spring which is the source of the water which runs through the canyon this spring is covered with cattails proceed to the right to about the middle of the slope of the mountains look with great care for three juniper trees which are very thick and set not far apart in front of these trees is a small precipice in which can be found a large flat rock on which a cross has been carved with a chisel. Between the trees and the rock exists a mine which belonged to a wealthy Spaniard named Jose Colon. The mine is so rich that the silver ore can be cut with a knife. The opening of the mine is covered by a large door we constructed from the timbers of the juniper. On top of this door is placed a large red rock. It will take 25 men to remove this rock. Just inside the door can be found gold crucifixes, images, platters, vases, and other items. Passing this, continue down into the mine shaft and you will encounter a tall stack of silver bars. Beyond this lies mining equipment. Thousands of families will be benefited by this wealth. So that's what the letter said when it was transcribed from the, from the priest, from the Castilian Spanish it was written in. Also, it turned out that they discovered that one of Pedro Navarez's men had escaped. He had hidden the cattails by the river, and he was badly wounded and bleeding, and he managed to make it to the Doña Ana mission. I believe that's around the Las Cruces area. So he made it to the mission where he confessed his sins and told about you know, the golden church items that were hidden in Soledad Canyon. And it was all written down by a priest. But the the priest considered it ramblings of a dying man, and he disregarded it and filed it away. But in October of 1879, the Apache war chief Victorio had attacked this mission and had killed many of the people there and ransacked the, the mission. And the Apaches took off with some of the gold and silver items. And the next day, while they were going through what was remaining in the mission and just kind of looking at the ransacked mess, the account of the dying outlaw was found, I believe, just on the floor in the mess. And it had been written down by this priest. And... When it was translated, what this dying outlaw in the gang said was, In Soledad Canyon, there is a natural cave in the brow of a hill opening towards the south. There is a cross cut into a rock above the entrance to the cave and directly in front of a young juniper tree. For better directions, there are three medium-sized peaks toward the rising sun whose shadows converge in the morning 250 paces east of the cave entrance and a little to the south. 
250 paces from this point directly north can be found an embankment from whereby looking straight ahead, you can see the, the Jornada del Muerto as far as the eye can see. The distance from this point to the cave should be exactly the same as the distance to the place where the shadows of the peaks converge. 100 paces from the entrance to the cave, down the arroyo, you will find a dripping spring. The entrance to the cave has been covered to the depth of a man's height. And ten paces beyond the entrance, there will be an adobe wall which must be torn down in order to gain access. At the bottom of a long tunnel, the cave separates into two parts. The left cave contains two mule loads worth of coined silver, and the right cave contains candlesticks, images, and crucifixes taken in the robbery. So this was the the dying um, gang member of Jose or of uh, Pedro Novares's um, gang. This was what he had said to this priest as he was dying, and I believe that uh, that the day after it was you know it was all written down, this gang member was he was dead at the mission. He he didn't last the night. So anyhow, so. Those are the details there, but there's there's more to it than that. So there's those two accounts with lots of details in them. Now the story continues in the fall of 1913. There is a man named Ben Brown. He's hunting deer in a remote canyon near Las Cruces. He was also a miner. So he fired at a deer and wounded it, but it slipped away. So he followed the blood trail a few hundred yards and he lost the blood trail and he sat down in the shade of a big juniper. As he scanned the mountain for the deer, he spotted something, an area that appeared to have been filled in, you know, with like rocks by humans. It didn't appear that it was anything normal in nature. So he trekked to that spot to examine it. One, and then once he was there, he looked up and he noticed three medium-sized peaks. And, you know, um, alluding to the, the dying outlaws account, he knew, he knew about this, about the three peaks. So in his mind, he's like, oh, this is, uh, this is possibly, you know, one of the clues in, in the legend. And so he remembered hearing about the legend of the, of the lost treasure. And so he starts pacing things off according to what he's heard in the in the legend and he gets to a point where he sees the the Jornada del Muerto or the dead man's route and he came to a spot where he thought there should be a dripping spring but he didn't find one but he was down i believe in the arroyo kind of down in the bottom of the wash at that point so he decided that he would dig into the sand, so he dug into the loose sand with his with his hands, and he found a water seep at eight inches deep. So he knew that this was probably the right place, and he went into town then to get some mining supplies, and he returned pretty soon. So when he returned, he watched the shadows of the peaks as the sun rose, and he saw the three peak shadows converge into one spot, and he marked that with a cairn of rocks, and then he paced off things from there, and and it appeared that, uh, you know, it it appeared as he kind of went through all all the pacing and 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 everything that. Uh, he appeared to be on track. And so he's working this area by himself. He gets, you know, to the spot where he's like, okay, this looks like a cave was filled in or so. He removes six feet of rock. And I think it was all placed there by hand. So, you know, he's got to move these, these big rocks. So he moves, he goes six feet into this cave, just removing rubble and rock and everything. And he came to this flat rock, and then he dusted off this great big flat rock and found a large crucifix carved into the stone, obviously by a chisel. It was definitely done by man. So 
progress was really slow at this point, and he figured he'd better file a mining claim for this area because he was pretty sure he was onto something here. So he went back into town, he filed a mining claim for the area, he got a bunch of supplies, and he returned. And he cut down the identifying juniper in case others were looking for this treasure. He didn't want them to find the juniper that helped him find, you know, this location. And he took a sledgehammer to the large flat rock that was bearing the carved in crucifix. And he broke apart that rock and, and got rid of it. And it sounds almost like this huge flat rock was almost like sealing up the cave a bit. And once he got rid of that, that flat rock, the cave, it, it was still full of rock. There was still a lot more rock. So eventually he makes 12 feet of progress, and then the cave starts to level out, and the passageway narrowed, and now he's crawling on his hands and knees, and and he's wondering if he's ever going to find any anything. So he's about to give up, and he finds a... I believe it was a silver Spanish coin. It had the date on it of 1635. So he knows, you know, this gives him motivation to keep going. He knows that he's onto something. It's not a, you know, a, a fool's errand that he's on. So soon he keeps going and he reaches this adobe wall. And he tears it down with a crowbar and he reached a chamber that, kind of opened up and it was open I think he said for about 10 feet or so and then it, it continued on and it was more gravel and rock and debris filled so at this point he's got to continue on so he's continuing to excavate and he found an ancient pickaxe and he sent it to a friend at the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History for ID. And he was told that it was a hand-forged metal pickaxe from a casting process in Spain in the 1500s or so. So he knew he was getting close. So the challenging thing with Ben Brown at this point is he needs his funding to continue this process. And he has other mining operations that are going on in the area, and that's his source of funding so he can continue to excavate this. So he runs into some issues where his mining operations, they're, they're becoming less and less prosperous, and they're requiring more and more of his attention. And he started losing money. So he had to close down some of his mining operations and take a job in Las Cruces, and, uh, and then he eventually worked in other mining operations and then as a forest ranger. And so he kind of put things on hold for uh, quite a while. I guess it was said around 20 years that he just had to work and he couldn't go back and forth and excavate anymore. So around 20 years later, he seeks some advice from an expert on New Mexico lore and legend. And, and uh, this gentleman, his name is Arturo Campa, and he is a professor at the University of Denver. So he's an expert about, you know, all this, the old Spanish stuff in the area. And so Brown told Campa about the cave in Soledad Canyon, and and he basically goes over all a lot of the details with him, and and at this at this point, what what happens is Campa's really interested in this. He knows about the legend and everything. He knows a lot of the details, and and at this point, though, Ben Brown says says that uh, you know I know the legend says that the that Soledad Canyon is in the Oregon mountains, but he says it's actually, it actually was a canyon of the same name in the Doña Ana range about 15 miles west. So then, you know, Campa, I believe he asks if, if he can come with him to see the site and, and Ben Brown says, yes, yeah, you can come and see the site. And he has Campa come down to see the site. So after seeing the site, Campa writes this, um, I don't know if it's a journal entry or a letter or where exactly he wrote it to, but he writes, he writes down that he says, 
The tunnel against the hillside had the appearance of a natural cave, very similar to the subterranean formations associated with Carlsbad Caverns, except there was no moisture and the floor was covered with topsoil. For a short distance we walked upright. Then we stopped and began crawling on all fours. About 200 feet down into the earth we came upon a point where the cave split into a Y with two directions. I took one side and Ben followed the other. This was as far as he had cleared, but I could see the passage continued indefinitely. Back at the surface, Ben pointed out the landmarks of the three peaks, the Jornada and the Spring. So this is what what Arturo Campo had wrote about his visit after he had been there. So after his visit when he had been there, Ben Brown, he's trying to get funding for like a, a couple of years. He's trying to get some funding because he doesn't have the funding he needs to keep going, but he wants to get some investors. And uh, a couple years later, Campa gets a letter from Ben Brown, and it's a real exciting letter. It's inviting him back to see his new discovery. He didn't want to write in the letter what he had found in case the letter fell into the wrong hands. And and he invited Campa to hurry up and come down. Well, Campa, he worked for the university. He had some things going on for, you know, the probably the rest of the semester or whatever. And he wasn't able to come down right away. So he was planning on coming down. But he had a lot of duties with the university. And he wasn't free to travel quite yet. So about four months later, Campa hears that, that Ben Brown has died. And he left no map. He didn't tell his wife or kids about the location. He left no details behind. So now only Campa knows anything about the site at all. But he died a short time later. So now no one knows what Brown had found or showed Campa or what his special discovery was. And now we may never know unless somebody stumbles across it again. So that is the story of Pedro Navarro's treasures and uh and the search for them so it appears they may still be out there like and subscribe if you like these kind of stories